How Democracy Destroyed Theocracy in America and Made It Worse No one thinks the United States was ever a theocracy. Signs indicate some of the Founding Fathers were believers, nothing unusual about this in a world where the Church was omnipresent. However, there were other signs which suggest some of these men did not have a Christian outlook. This is somewhat irrelevant. But we can assume that as were the Founding Fathers, so was the nation they established. It is important to understand that if America is a democratic republic now, it was a democratic republic at its founding. Its political, economic, and religious character has not changed fundamentally. What has changed is its technical ability to exercise democracy. America was famously formed upon the will of we the people, a grandiose and rather meaningless term. It refers to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's conception of the social contract. Nature was considered Darwinian by the writers of the time. Without a cessation of hostilities, a war of all against all would continue between all men. In an environment in which the hand of each was turned against all, civilization would not be possible. The agreement by which men decided to cooperate rather than compete was called the social contract. While even the writers of the time knew the details were fictitious, the story helped them and us to understand how man emerged from a brutish state to a more civilized one. We stopped competing and started cooperating to benefit us all. The Constitution was an effort to recreate this primary condition of cooperation and to establish a republic based on the commonweal. The problems the founders faced are legion and well known, but there is an issue rarely dwelled on and insurmountable by them. What the founders thought of as we the people is an abstraction. There never was a common will, nor, if the truth were known, something we could point to analogous to the people. It was a mythology created to make the Constitution believable. Even were there a people and a will of the people, this will could not be known. Democracy is a way to whittle down millions of voices into a more manageable number. In so doing the will of the people is all the better shown to be a useless abstraction. One man elected represents many thousands of voters, but also many more thousands of objectors to the selection made. The system formulated then still exists now, if with a few minor adjustments. But the system does not seem to work as well as it did. This leaves many of us shaken and confused. What has gone wrong? Have people changed or has someone altered something without our knowledge? Have we made an adjustment seemingly innocuous that has impacted the system in an unforeseen way? Democracy exists because the will of the people is unknown, unknowable, and at best a useless abstraction. There is no people in the sense the framers wanted us to believe. There is no social contract and never could be. We are playing mind games with ourselves. The narrative of democracy prevents us understanding what went wrong. It also prevents us from fixing the problem. We talk about the division in society, but we even get this wrong. It's all a mind game meant to deceive just to keep the system going. The divisions in society are a distraction, not real. The only division that matters is the one between the flesh and the spirit, between the rule of man and the rule of God. It does not matter which men rule which men. How they choose to rule men is also irrelevant. Every system man can devise which puts power into the hands of men is ungodly and unscriptural. At one time even when men ruled over other men, they ruled in the name of God. This made a difference. Monarchs rarely ruled as if their power flowed from them. They considered themselves answerable to God. Technology did not exist that would have enabled the king or other ruler to control the minds and values of their subjects, as is now possible in this day of mass media propagandists and social media tycoons. 
Democracy is better able to transform mass movements and popular opinion into political power than monarchies are or were. The leverage of those in power is much greater now than in the days of kings and knights. Whereas the king was forced to consider what God wanted in order to legitimize his policy, the ruling party can now posit any policy they wish and claim this is the will of the people. More importantly, they have the tools of mass propaganda to make the policy seem popular. Even when the state was not considered a theocracy, even when as in the United States, there was a separation of church and state, the state could not legitimize its policy without reference to the will of God. There was no simple way of representing the will of the people. Even with the qualifications having been made concerning the beliefs of the founders, the Declaration of Independence still found it necessary and convenient to begin the preamble with the words, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are embodied by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Without a God to justify their claims the only recourse would be to claim the United States had more guns and more resolve and was bound to separate in order to enjoy certain pleasures. Yet, it remains difficult to get people to understand the Second Amendment is meant to protect the people against the will of the people should it become onerous. The will of the people was not of such power it could overthrow the rights of any portion of the people. The Constitution is written expressly to curtail the power of democracy and put limits on what the desire of the majority could bring about. What is the will of the people but a policy that is supported by a majority? Yet we know opinions can be manipulated and poll results are changed by the way the question is asked. Were there a will of the people, how could it be ascertained in a way that was not distinctly political and contrived? Perhaps our loss of faith in our political institutions is the realization of how much of our opinion is manufactured by those with a political agenda. Even those who do want to know what people think have a difficult time finding out what this is. It is a problem made worse if the pollster is strongly opinionated. It is difficult to find people who are not biased when the issue is important. Even when we can collate opinion, is the opinion based on logic and facts or emotion and personal experience? More importantly what we know as a people is often what those with the capacity to spread their version of the facts want us to know. Mass media reaches more people in more concentrated ways than was possible in the past. More broad-based consensus is possible because it is more possible for the elites to tell the people what to think. And this causes problems because the simple message is more easily spread than the more developed argument. With every issue there are at least two sides. The side that can be simplified the most is often the side that can be promoted more readily. This problem is more apparent in the United States because of the two-party system. Each party specializes in promoting one side of every problem. If you have a nation with two parties each with their own version of mass media, what would one get but divided opinion? If every question has two opposite sides, what will be produced but people determined not to permit the opposite narrative to prevail? Democracy is usually pitted against things such as monarchy and totalitarian dictatorships. But the differences are largely cosmetic. All forms of rulership other than a theocracy leaves human beings in a seat reserved for God. Democracy ought to make things better by giving people freedom from autocrats. But democracy is solving the wrong problem. The problem is not which men are governing which men and how, though this is a problem. The problem is theocratic rights and mankind's ignorance of them. There are different ways to present the issue. Regardless of how the problem is expressed, it comes down to a simple and single fact which all persons everywhere fully understand. The author of a work always has the rights that come with first origination. We know and understand this right as humans applied to our own persons. 
If we are the first person to come up with the idea, story, or invention, and we make it known to others, we own it as we have presented it. This is not a complicated issue nor is it a difficult right to define and protect. The author owns his or her works. Saying this, we are faced with one inescapable fact. Regardless of if you are a believer or not, you know humans have never created anything physical. All of physical reality existed before any human being was formed. We are physical and therefore we were created by something that is not human and which existed before us. All that has happened during the course of our history is that reality has been transformed by us. We added value to what we were given, but we did not add one atom to the supply of atoms that existed prior to our arrival. Yet, we the people believe with a majority opinion comes rights. We think our opinion in the plural matters. In our worldview we the people can vote in a representative body and that this representative body can decide that we the people can claim territory, claim forests, lands, water and even sky. But we formed none of it and we originated none of it. We are usurpers and tyrants regarding the things that belong to God. And if not God, if God is not the owner and the author, then who? Because no person can defend their claim to any part of God's kingdom. At best, with a gun and other weapons you can deprive the use of this property to other persons. But no one can claim any greater right to geographical elements than that claim made by someone else. The legitimacy of all these claims is precisely zero and of no merit and prima facie absurd. No amount of people voting on the issue of ownership or using guns to impose their will on others makes their claim legitimate. The property of Earth, the geography of the planet, belongs to God and none other. We only make things worse attempting to prosecute our absurd and fictitious claims. Planting a flag does not confer ownership on your sovereign. The land and all nature belong to God, it is His creation and all those who would deny this, deny God. Human claimants to God's creation are absurd and infringe the very laws of reason. When the rights of God to His creation are challenged, you remove the foundation of all rights. Denying God his rights leaves man with nothing but rights founded on bigger guns and fewer scruples.